This next gentleman, a uh, good friend and a tremendous uh, just proprietary guy that really promotes fishing and has done a great job over his career. And uh, in fact, he's got two television shows, but he dropped one because he loves the, he loves the one he has because he has such a passion for it. But I think without uh, another person from a tackle company, and this is John Thielen from Lindy Little Joe, and he will tell you also the importance of his company having a delivery system and the need for live baits to deliver that. Thank you, John Thielen here. I don't have the memory Tom has. I've got notes with me today. I uh, was really excited when I got a call from John Peterson last week asking if I would speak about this because this, in my opinion, this bait shortage might be the biggest challenge we face in fishing today. And I wanna, I, I'm gonna expound a little bit on some of the things that Greg said because they're spot on, but I sat down and I tried to, I tried to take my assignment that John gave me and start putting together numbers. And you know what happened? I realized that the Lindy piece of this, the Northland piece of this, the, the Normark piece, all of us, we're just the tip of the iceberg. It's so much bigger. And one of the things that I can tell you that I know for sure over the years from tournament fishing and TV, I've gotten to fish all over the country and, and I've seen a lot of fisheries. And I know this, when people ask me, where is the best fishery? I always say it's right in Minnesota. And it's because we have access, we have the resource and we have everything we need to be successful here because we have the backing of the sportsmen. And one of the things I know for sure is as I've traveled the country fishing in other places, you don't always find that. It's a tricky deal to find, but we have it here. Now I know that this minnow shortage thing for this year, the DNR has done a great job of coming up with some answers for the short term, but long-term bait shortages are gonna have an effect that goes so much deeper than Lindy Fishing Tackle. And I wanna take a minute and share that with you. First thing I wanna start by saying is I think everybody in this room and everybody in the fishing community is gonna to have to realize at a certain point that fishing has changed. I remember fishing openers with my father like they were yesterday. We would go to Mille Lacs Lake, we'd put the boat in the water, we'd go freeze our butts off, catch one or two fish all night long. And we put it back on the trailer and we'd say, what a great trip. And it was because it was about the experience but you can blame social media, we can blame cultural and generational changes. Fishing's changed. The experience is not the number one piece for young people in this sport anymore. The number one piece in this sport is success. Nobody posts anything on Facebook or Instagram where it's just a picture of them and their dad saying, what a great trip we had, we never caught anything. We've forgotten the experience. It's all about success today. So with that, I would share this. That's a cultural thing. It's a generational thing that we can't change. So we're going to have to learn to work with it to be successful, not only in the private sector, but in the public sector as well. So when it comes down to it, I want to I want to tell you a little story, and I'm going to use Tom as an example. I called Tom earlier this week. Let's take the hottest fishery in the state of Minnesota right now, Lake Winnebagosh. Everybody's going there, launches are full. I drive by it and I, I'm, I, it's awesome. I mean, everybody's catching fish and having a great time. Here's what I'll tell you though. Tom Newstrom and another friend of mine, Carl Adams, up at Timberline and Black Duck, every single day they're going over to Winnie with their customers and here's what they're doing on the way though. They're grabbing their minnows for the day. Now these guys, they've been guiding out there forever and they know what they're doing and they're gonna catch fish. And what do they still do? They still stop every day for minnows because they know when they put clients in that boat, the best odds of those clients being bit are with minnows. So ultimately we know that bait is needed to maximize bites, but let me share something with you. I'm not worried about Tom Newstrom, nor am I worried about Carl Adams. What I'm worried about is the 99% of anglers who put their boats in right behind these guys that morning. Because without live bait, 
those guys are the guys who go three to four times a year, okay? If you're in the private sector in tackle right now, I think Greg would echo this. I think John would echo this from the past. Our customer, our number one customer goes fishing three to four times a year. They are not what I would call an avid angler like everybody in this room. They need live bait to catch fish. That's the 99% of anglers out there. So ultimately, if Tom and Carl know they've got to have live bait to catch fish, what's going to happen to those 99% of anglers that day? They're going to take one of those three to four chances to fish all year. They're going to go out fishing and not catch them. What if it happens a second time? What if it happens a third time? There's a lot of other things to do in our society right now. And if people are not successful, the experience is no longer enough to bring them back. It was for most of us in this room. We enjoyed fishing with our family so much that we kept coming back whether we caught them or not. Young people nowadays, they're not doing that. Let me give you another example. Up at the Northwest Angle, I work with a couple of resorts up there. When Canada put in the restrictions on driving your boat across the border with live bait, going fishing all day in Canada and coming back into Minnesota water to your resort, all those guys did it. They were able to go do it. But when they put the restriction in eliminating live bait, here's what all those resorts said. No big deal. We'll, we'll grab our plastics. We'll go into Canada waters and we'll whack them because that's what they all thought would happen. Let me tell you what they're all doing right now. Joe Henry knows this. I did it the last time I was up there filming. I'm driving into Canada. I'm going to a floating raft that's put out there by a bait dealer because I can't legally touch shore. I'm reaching over onto that floating raft. I'm opening a cooler and I'm getting my live bait and my receipt for the day that I paid for the night before. Then I'm going out whacking fish. Here's what's happening. Everybody's doing that because they found out. I mean, heck, if there's anywhere you can think of or you should be able to go get them with plastics, it's a north end of Lake of the Woods. But these guys found out real quick how important live bait was. So now they're all going to that floating raft every morning. Ultimately, it's about success. Those guides all started hearing it. Those resorts started hearing it. They had to come up with a solution to put live bait back in the boat. And that's what they did. I want to talk a little bit about the retail side of things. I talked to two stores this week. I talked to Carl Adams up at Timberline. Okay, that's in Black Duck, Minnesota. And I mean, it's a highway headed for Red Lake. Um, and I also talked to Greg Mortensen up at Outdoors again in Baudette. These guys sell a lot of bait. But here's the story they both had. When a customer walks in and says, you have shiners, you have rainbows, you have fatheads. Every single time, if they say no, they say that customer does a U-turn, walks right out the door, they're going to go somewhere else, just like Tom said earlier. Here's what that really cost everybody at that moment. Both of them said that if they can say, come on back, I'll get you all set up, we'll put them in a bag or we'll put them in your bucket. Well, they are filling that bag or bucket. That customer walks around that store and they both put the number at $50 to $150 additional spend per group if they have minnows they're going to pay for. If they do not have minnows they're going to pay for, they don't buy it. They, they walk out the door and they move on. That's how important minnows are to these people. Let's talk about the economic impact if we lose angler success. Tackle sales. Like I said, I tried to put a number on this and I just put my pencil down on the desk and I thought to myself, I can't put a number on this. It's devastating. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the loss will be huge because just like Greg said, we're a live bait delivery company. I would say 90% of the Lindy, Phil, and Little Joe catalogs are live bait delivery systems, and they're relied on every day by the angler to catch fish. But you know what? Let's go deeper than this. Let's think about boat sales. Holy smokes, if you're not successful on the water, do you really think people are going to keep buying boats and coming back? That's going to come to an end. Small business retail sales, we've already talked a little bit about, but what about those large businesses at retail? What about Cabela's right over here? Think of the sales tax alone that's contributed to the system out of Cabela's. When it comes down to it, that little minnow is going to cost so much money if we're short of it because we could lose anglers due to the lack of success. 
What about those resorts that have been full across northern Minnesota since COVID? What's going to happen if they go back to half capacity? And they're already doing it, by the way. We've ASA says we've lost an awful lot of those anglers. We added. Well, here's the thing. We're already starting to lose those people. What if they can't have success when they go fishing? Now we're going to lose even more and the resort suffers more. And then the next piece is the economic impact on state funds. And I think this is where a lot of times we get really mixed up. We think if we lose anglers, what do we lose? Fishing license sales. That's, that's legitimate. We're going to lose fishing license sales. But I think that's a lot smaller piece of the pie than what we all think. Because ultimately, what if we lose the marine sales that we're talking about? All the licenses that go on boats. I'll tell you what, I just licensed my new boat for the year the other day. It's not cheap to license a boat in Minnesota. Okay? So we're going to lose a lot of that when we lose anglers. But the general fund sales tax dollars that we generate as an industry is phenomenal. So while we all think about 30 bucks at a time with a fishing license, I'm a little more concerned with what's the big loss when it comes to that general fund sales tax, whether it's boat sales, general merchandise sales, fuel sales, that 50 to 100 bucks, 50 to 150 bucks at a crack. So to close this, I just made some notes that I, in my mind, as a fisherman and as a businessman in the industry for years, these are so important. Number one is live bait is imperative to angler success in Minnesota. And I, I really believe that. 99% of people will stumble and fall without live bait, and then they'll quit fishing. Without success, because it's no longer just about the experience, we're going to lose participation. There's no doubt in my mind. This is the one that scares me, though. This is the biggest one that spooks me. <laughs> I can't even put words to it. If we lose today's adult participation, Kevin Kirkfleet's in the back of the room from River Valley Marine. Over at River Valley, sales are down right now in a certain demographic that scare all of us. They're down across the board. After a boat and sports show season, I will tell you the age demographic of 30 to 40, pushing a stroller and toting along another toddler by hand looking to buy their first boat, they're gone. They're not at boat shows. They're not at sports shows. And we've all noted that all year. Where did these people go? But they're not there. Well, I'll tell you what, the economy is already taking a toll on those young folks. But let me let you in on something. If we don't make fishing easier, make it so that when they do go, they're successful. Here's what's devastating for all of us, private sector and public. They don't teach their kids. If they don't take their kids, we lost a generation. That's what's devastating. We've got to make sure that we have continued success for those parents and those grandparents. Because I'll tell you what, I think high school fishing, and student angler fishing, I think it's great. I think kids fishing deals are great. I donated to one yesterday. It was the last thing I did for the day. But I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever forget the number one recruitment tool we have in fishing is families. Families have to want to go on vacation. They have to want to be in our sport and they have to have success to stay. We have to make sure we ensure that. I'll finish with this. I'm not a biologist. I don't fully understand the challenges that come along with stopping invasive species or limiting the spread and trapping minnows. But I do know we can't do one and not the other. We've got to find a way to take care of both ends of this spectrum right now. I don't think there's anybody in this room who would say, let's not worry about invasive species. I think we all are. But we have to have that supply of live bait as well. So my hope would be that the state, minfish, and all of the sportsmen that this affects can all work together to find solutions whether it's opening additional opportunities for the trappers, which I think we all prefer. Let's keep the money in Minnesota, right? But I also say if importation is a supplemental answer, I think we need to do it. At the end of the day, we have to do both. We have to make sure anglers have success every single day of the week, 
while we try to stop those invasive species. Thank you all for the opportunity to talk today.